Good evening. Let everybody get filed in here. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you here and invite you back at any opportunity you can be here. We're a little short on announcements tonight, but that may be a good thing. I see some faces back that's been in way and some that's just passing through, I think. So, so it's good to have those back with us that's been gone. Traveling out of town, though, Patrick and Holly are out of town. Serving tonight, Mark will be leading us in singing. We'll ask Matt Middlebrooks to lead the opening prayer. Ryan English will take care of the closing prayer. And Evan Huber will bring us the invitation. Is there, and Cody is in the audio-visual booth. Is there anything further I need to announce? First song tonight is the Solid Rock. We'll have two songs, and then we'll ask Matt to come up and do the opening prayer, and then we'll be dismissed the class after the after that prayer.
Let us pray. Father, we come before you now at the beginning of this service, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to take a break out of our weeks and to come together and be with like-minded Christians and to study your word and to sing songs of praise to you and to strengthen and edify one another. Lord, we pray that you be with those that are traveling and ask that you will watch over them and help keep them safe and pray that they will arrive to their destination safely. Lord, there are many on our minds that are sick and dealing with illnesses and lost loved ones and we pray, Lord, that you will be with them and give them strength during this time and pray that those that are sick will be returned back to their normal health. Lord, we pray that you be with the leaders of this country and ask that you will watch over them and pray that they will look to you for guidance in the decisions that we make, that we can, that they make, that we can continue to enjoy the freedoms that we have today in this nation and that we can continue to gather together publicly and to worship you, Lord. We pray that as we go throughout the Bible class tonight that you will be with the teachers, that they can present in a way that can be understood by all and pray that you be with us as students, that we will listen and take the things that we hear tonight and learn and examine our lives and that we can leave here and be a shining light to the world around us and be an example to bring lost souls to you. We pray, Lord, that everything that we do here this evening is done with, in accordance with your will. It's in your son's most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're in Proverbs chapter 14, ready to begin at verse 23. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Do you ever work with anybody that just stood around and talked most of the time? <laughs> Dale's going now. <laughs> the crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. I... In, in thinking about, you know, the, Solomon has said quite a bit about riches and poverty, poor, the poor and the rich, and, and so on and so forth. And the crown of the wise is their riches. And I, and I wanted to look at a couple other Proverbs we've already read, actually, in this. Back in chapter 13, if you will, uh, verses 7 and 8, there is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. And we talked about how that, you know, the riches here is not in material wealth, but rather in quality of life in regards to family relationships, uh, social relationships, and certainly one's relationship with God. But then in verse 8, 
The ransom of a man's life is his riches, but the poor does not hear rebuke. And I remember when we talked about this verse, uh, that we, we talked about the ransom of a man's life, and, and we talked about how that, you know, ransom has to do with uh, paying in order to get something back, to redeem something, as it were. Uh, and so we talked about the security of, of a person's uh, riches. The poor does not hear rebuke. So you've got to tie the two together, the two ideas, uh, as Proverbs does. And whenever you think about the ransom of a man's life is his riches, is re- regards to his ability to be able to take correction, to be able to hear instruction, to have the kind of wisdom that we talked about uh, in regards to uh, the understanding and the knowledge of God's instruction. So the poor does not hear rebuke. And that ties in several times the uh, proverb writer talks about the inability uh, that people have of not listening to instruction or correction and that's the idea there regards to the poor. You're poor in regards to your quality of life because you're not listening to rebuke. And so you have to put that into that parallel. Uh, and then go to chapter 14 and verse 20. The poor man is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich has many friends. And we talk there about how that people think that they, they become friendly with someone who is materially well off and that they might be able to profit to be able to get a gain or some uh, benefit as a result of being friends with a rich man. And so, so and, and the reason I wanted to go back and read these after reading this proverb here in, in uh, verse 24 <clears throat> is to show that how Solomon uses the word rich in different ways. Sometimes, by the context, we can kind of tell that rich there is material wealth. But at other times, it has to do with quality of life. So the crown of the wise is their riches. And I think here he's talking about quality of life. And when he goes on then to say the foolish, uh, but the foolish of foolishness of fools is folly. New King James Version says actually that word folly is exactly the same word as foolish in the Hebrew language. And so uh, I, I, I don't know why the king, does anybody have a translation that, that you, says the foolishness of fools is fool, foolish? I guess the reason they translated it folly instead of foolish, because like I said, it's the very same word in the Hebrew. I guess the reason they did it is simply to keep from sounding ridiculous, (laughs) overly redundant. The foolishness of the fools is foolishness. Uh, Anyway, so that's why I think here in verse 24, he's talking about the riches, the crown of the wise. And whenever he uses wise, of course, that's always the same in the Proverbs regarding someone who has the wisdom of God's instruction of of understanding God's will. So, questions or comments? Something that he has also addressed before is the idea of a false witness. We talked about the ninth commandment of the old law the law of Moses. And so he says in verse 25, a true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaks lies. And the idea of a true witness delivering souls, of course, is the fact that when someone bears true witness to someone's innocence, uh, the only reason someone would bear false witness generally we think of a false witness as being someone who is trying to get someone in trouble or convicted. However, a false witness can also be someone who's trying to get a buddy off 
you know, to get someone not convicted. But a truth, so here the idea of a deceitful witness carries with it the idea of someone who's trying to get someone convicted or in trouble, whereas a true witness delivers souls. Verse 26 and 27. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Fear of the Lord, wisdom of the Lord, instruction of the Lord, understanding of the Lord, fear of the Lord being reverence of him, respecting what he has to say, being awed of, of the Lord. And uh, Lord here, uh, does anybody have a translation that says Jehovah in verse 26, 27? Uh, I think uh, probably American Standard would be, a, you've got it, yeah, American Standard, yeah. Yeah, they do an excellent job of always translating that, Yahweh as Jehovah. Uh, but anyway, uh, so when you have that fear of the Lord, when you have that respect of Jehovah, you're going to have that strong confidence. And you know what? We're supposed to have confidence. We're supposed to have faith that God's promises will be fulfilled. And that, I tell you, the greatest promise that I take confidence in, that I take consolation in, I guess would be a good word, is forgiveness, mercy, and so whenever we have that reverence of God, we can have that strong confidence. But there's other aspects of our confidence in God. For instance, His watch care over us. And that's something that we can't take for granted. We can't take for granted the fact that God watches over us. And we're going to see a verse, uh, a proverb in a little bit that will refer to that. Uh, but, you know, God loves us. God wants the best for us. And when we have that fear of the Lord, we get the best. Now that doesn't obviously mean that we don't ever have hard times or trials or tribulations. Obviously we do. But how do we come through it? You know, that's the question. How do we deal with it? How do we come through it? So the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The quality of life. Again, it goes back to that riches that we were talking about a moment ago. We are rich in quality of life. God teaches us how to live the best kind of life. And when we have confidence in Him, in His promises, and so it turns one away from the snares of death. And again, <laughs> we have often seen the promise of long life and, and, and uh, escaping uh, death. And, and we put that into the realm of the proverb that if everything is... Normal, I guess I would say, all things being equal, we're going to have longevity. And we've referred often to the commandment of children obeying your parents that it may be well with you and you may live long upon the earth. And we have seen that also in the Proverbs where he said that if children will listen to the instruction of their father and of their mother, they'll have a long life. And that just simply is saying you're going to escape the perils that foolishness often brings about. Questions or comments? In the multitude of people is a king's honor, but in lack of people is the downfall of a prince. You can put this in regards to uh, material things if you want. Uh, for instance, taxation. Uh, every king has his taxation, and so the more, the greater his realm, of course, the richer he is, and the greater honor he has. Uh, to put it in regards to the way we think today, 
uh, a president of a third world country, you know, we, we don't think much of that person's uh, power and, and uh, dignity, whereas someone who becomes president over a great nation, you know, that's someone with great power and, and as a result of that, honor. And so that's kind of the idea behind this here. Now, put it in perspective of when Solomon was writing. Who was the greatest king in Israel? Not the richest, the greatest. David. <clears throat> David. David. Had to have been David. He's the one that had the greatest, uh, well, Solomon actually had the greatest territory as far as the kingdom, but he, he, he stood on David's foundation. He built on what David had accomplished. And, and so uh, David, you know, Solomon was undoubtedly the wealthiest and I guess we'd say the wisest king in Israel, uh, but uh, David would have been the greatest. And, and there's his honor is in the multitude of people that followed him. Leadership, of course, has a lot to do with that. Verse 29, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. That word impulsive uh, actually literally means short. And my middle margin says short, short of spirit. But actually, that's, that's probably not the best translation in regards to what's being said here, and so slow, uh, uh, short of temper would be probably the best way to, to say that. So he who is slow to wrath has great understanding. It is, a, it is a result, of course, of the teaching of God, the wisdom of God. Uh, let every man be slow to wrath, uh, sw uh, slow to speak, and swift to hear. And, and so... Uh, we are taught by God to be temperate in our temper, I guess I'd say. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. So he's talking about a sound heart. Now, when you read that, you might think of that blood pumper in your body, you see, that that's life to the body, to be able to have a strong heart that way. That's really not the context here. Again, you have to look at the yin and the yang of it, the, the, the comparison that he's making here. So what's the comparison? Envy is rottenness to the bones. So the sound heart here is, is referring to the spiritual heart of man. To, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. I'm not talking about the blood pumper. I'm talking about the inner being. And I think that's the idea here because of the comparison it's making. Whenever someone has a sound inner being, that's life. You're not dealing with envy, bitterness, jealousy. Those things that eat you up inside, that destroy the inner man, the inner heart. And so it's, uh, so I don't think we should take that as the blood pumper, but rather as the inner being of a person. Questions or comments? And you, you were comparing David, what, what made him greater than, than any of the kings was the fact that he was a man that says, after God's own heart, these other kings didn't have that mindset. They, they were looking at great things and they used their people to get those things for them. David loved his people and, uh, and, and he wasn't like that at all. Right. And he loved the Lord and, and, and he was dedicated to being what God wanted him to be. 
Not a perfect man, obviously, and, and that's the beautiful thing about God's Word is it shows us both sides of everybody, but, but he was a man after God's own heart. He was a man that loved the Lord, wanted to please the Lord, so that whenever his sin was pointed out, what was his, I have sinned against God. Verse 31, He who oppresses the poor reproaches his Maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. Later on, and, and I'm going to go ahead and refer to this, I, I generally don't like to jump forward in the Proverbs. Uh, uh, sometimes I like to, as I've already done tonight, to refer to some we've already read. But I want to jump forward to chapter 22 and verse 2 because it explains the first part of this proverb. 22 and verse 2. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. And so that's why he who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker. Because we all have the same creator. We all have the same maker. And in our uh, Constitution, Bill of Rights, what? All men created equal. And that's what Solomon's telling us. God made us all. And so if I denigrate another human being, I'm denigrating part of God's creation. He who honors him has mercy on the needy. The him here is God. And so those who honor God has mercy on the needy. This is a very common theme of the prophets and of Solomon and the Proverbs of caring for the poor, caring for the needy. We are to look out for the orphan and the widow, uh, to look out for uh, those who have a reason uh, to be poor. Solomon has already addressed the indolent person, the person who won't work. He talked about the, you know, the, the poor man whose field, whose fallow field is full of fruit. You know, he's not reaping anything because he's not planting anything. He's not working the field. It's fallow. It's not being worked. That's why he's poor. But there are people who are poor beyond their, circ or beyond their control, beyond their own circumstance, uh, and that's the one that we're to have mercy on. And that's why the widow and the orphan was such a common theme at that time, because they had to rely upon the goodness, the mercy, the benevolence of their neighbors, the people that knew them. And uh, they didn't have uh, some of the government programs that we're fortunate enough to have. And it is, you know, the, the government programs we have is a blessing for the poor. It's just unfortunate that it's abused by the lazy. <laughs> Would I dare to say that? <laughs> yeah. Questions or comments? Thirty. 32, the wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has a refuge in his death. Again, comparing the two, when you talk about being banished. And he, he talks later on about, uh, the, about uh, the foolish and sheol and destruction. And that's the idea here. It, the, this banishment is God's banishment. We can often think of wicked people being caught in their wickedness, whatever, you know, if it's a criminal thing, uh, being banished by a community uh, or a village at, at that time, something like that. But, but you put it in, again, in comparison to the second part of this proverb, the righteous has a refuge in his death. And so the banishment is the banishment of the Lord. 33. Wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding, but what is in the heart of fools is made known. 
as the as the uh, heart thinks, so it, so the mouth speaks. Uh, and that's the idea here. And of course, wisdom uh, is part of him who has understanding. That's just the theme. I mean, if there's a theme running through Proverbs, there it is. 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I found an interesting uh, comment by uh, Albert Barnes on this verse uh, where he uh, said that in the Hebrew, it, it could be possible to be able to translate this, righteousness exalts a nation, and piety uh, keeps people from reproach or something to that extent. And, and anyway, uh, I think the way that they translated it, the way, the way that I read it in the New King James Version is, is appropriate. Righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach to any people. And the reason why I think that's appropriate is because that has been, that's the theme of the prophets. They, Israel would be punished for their sin. And the nations that God used to punish them would be punished for their sins. And uh, that uh, was a, a common theme in uh, Habakkuk. Habakkuk. And uh, that uh, Habakkuk, got to be careful here. Yeah, Habakkuk. Uh, common theme in Habakkuk questioned God about why God would use a nation more ungodly than Israel and Judah, particularly Judah at this occasion, to punish them. You know, here you are, as it were, you know, using the, the really, really bad kid to punish the eh, not so good kid. <laughs> Israel certainly, you see, the, the thing is, Israel knew better, should have known better. Judah should have known better. And so Habakkuk's cry to God was, why are you using these heathens? These, these, I mean, these people that are, have always been idolaters. You know, they, they, they don't have a speck of righteousness in them. And you're using them to punish your people. And God said, don't worry, I'll punish them too. They'll, they'll get theirs. I'm using them now as an instrument, but they're not escaping my judgment. They're not escaping my wrath. And that uh, is a good lesson throughout the... I mean, that's the theme, that's the, the, the thread of the prophets. So as long as a nation is righteous, it prospers with God's blessings. But when a nation becomes unrighteous as a nation, it's a reproach and it will fall under God's judgment. That's all part of God's providence. Questions or comments? It makes me think of a conversation that you and I, you and I had had about, you know, our country and all the good that came as a result of the you know, restoration movement and the gospel spreading, you know, to different parts of the world from that and, you know, how... Our country's been taken care of. You know, God's over, looked over our country, but the further we're getting away from God, it's, you know, we're preparing ourselves for, you know, just a coming fall. And Yeah, and, and that's an obvious observation. You know, we have to make that observation. And <laughs> you, you have to wonder how far do we go before God says, that's it. You know, and well, I tell you, it's it's a slippery slope that we've been on, and I many times we've made the observation we never thought we'd see some of the things that we see today. You know, never thought we'd see some of this in our country, but here it is, and so 
unrighteousness breeds unrighteousness. It just, it'll just keep getting worse until God says, That's, I, I can't take that anymore. The, uh, I, I can't, I've got to make this comment. Uh, it's much like the dead church in Sardis. God was going to judge that dead church, Revelation chapter 3. But it had some people in it, some individuals in it, that were still in fellowship with Him, that were still righteous. And that's the way it will be in a lot of nations that God judge. God may judge the nation, but that doesn't make everybody in it unrighteous. And so our goal, our challenge, is we've got to stay the righteous ones. We've got to stay the light. And we may not be able to save the nation, but we can save our souls and the church. All right. So verse 35, the king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him who causes shame. Obviously, you take this application with God. Just like a king is going to favor a wise servant. And you've got to stop and think about the parable that Jesus taught, the parable of the talents. You know, here's two servants that prospered for him. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then you've got the servant that didn't prosper him at all. Uh, didn't lose anything, but he didn't gain anything. And I guess in that sense, he caused shame. He didn't work, didn't apply himself. And so uh, God's favor is toward a wise servant. His wrath is against him who causes shame, just like it is true with a king or a master over anybody. Questions or comments? Chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. I mentioned a moment ago that that word uh, folly was uh, the same word as as fools or foolish, and, and here's the same word again here in the end of verse 2, foolishness. It's the same word translated folly earlier. But a soft answer turns away wrath. Again, generally, that's true. When someone comes at you angry, if you remain calm and uh, reasonable, generally, It'll calm them down. But if you respond with the same kind of harshness uh, that they had, then you cause the friction continues. It's just simple uh, conflict resolution. So the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. Again, the idea of knowledge, understanding, wisdom. The mouth of fools pours forth foolishness, which he's already spoken of that. He's, he, he has a lot to say about the tongue, doesn't he? Questions or comments? Here it is, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. This is what I said a moment ago we would see later on. Whenever he talked about the how that the uh, uh, person who the oppresses the poor reproaches his maker and so on and so forth, God's watching everything. And, and when I was talking about his watch care over us and the riches that we have at his hand, God knows us. Jesus put it this way, didn't he? The number of the hair on your head, God knows the number. That's how intimately God knows us and, and how, how he, he watches over us. And keeping watch on the evil and the good. So many times when people 
suffer bad things. Well, where was God? Where, what doesn't God care? Yeah, he cares. And someone once said, you know, God's been in the same place He was when His Son died on the cross. God is, is watching over us. And with His people, whenever Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord to those that are called according to His purpose. Even though we may go through bad times, whatever they may be, we have got to look at the end result. We've got to look at the, the goal, the prize at the end of the road. We can't get stuck looking at what's happening right now. We've got to keep our focus on that which is ahead of us. And that's not to say we deny the present. That's not to say that we don't suffer, or grieve, whatever, during hard times. But it's, it's just that we never give up. You know, we don't stop where we're at. If, if we're stuck somewhere, get unstuck. <laughs> you know, don't, don't just sit there and spin your wheels. And so... Uh, he is keeping watch on the evil and the good. That is, that's, a, that's a comfort. Whenever you talk about there's comfort in those that fear the Lord, consolate, there it is. There's a good one right there. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Again, more on the tongue. More on we've got to watch what we say. Uh, Is that the first one or the second one? First one? Okay. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives correction is prudent. We've seen this before, and we made a statement about it a moment ago. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but in the revenue of the wicked is trouble. Again, do we take this as material wealth? You know, so the, the, the preachers of health and wealth and so on and so forth, they, they use verses like this. And I think they misuse them. I think they abuse them. Again, the treasure is the riches that we have in life. Life isn't all about how much, your bank, how much you have in a bank account. Life is all about how you feel about it, <laughs> you know. But the revenue, the income of the wicked is trouble. But the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. Again, as the heart thinks, uh, so the mouth speaks. Verses 8 and 9. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who follows righteousness. We've looked at uh, verses before uh, that, that deal with uh, what God uh, wants from us. We, we already considered uh, a couple of weeks ago or maybe last week, I guess, Micah 6, 8, uh, where he has shown you, O man, wh what is good, what the Lord required to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But when I think about uh, the unrighteous sacrifice, the, the sacrifices of the wicked, I think about what Malachi wrote to the people. You know, they had... I don't know... Uh, Religion, and I use that word in, in its, I guess, its most strict sense. Maybe righteousness, I should say. Righteousness waxes and wanes in, with generations. And Malachi wrote at a time, the people had come through uh, the, the captivity in Babylon and Assyria. Had, you know, a great number of them had come back, rebuilt Jerusalem, rebuilt the temple. 
And a generation goes by, actually uh, almost uh, two or three generations go by, and now Malachi, this prophet, is indicting them for their poor sacrifices, I'll say. Malachi chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, I'm going to read those. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Then you jump over to verse 13 in chapter 1. You also say, oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick, thus you offer an offering. Uh, should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? So here the people, they, they had religion, but it was uh, as if they, well, I mean, obviously, they, their heart wasn't it. They're, they're going through the form but without the Spirit. And that's our challenge. You know, there's a strong lesson in this for us. And that is, we often quote John 4.24 where Jesus said that we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. And if we, if we worship in truth, you know, do we glory just in that? Or do we not realize that that's only half of what we're charged with? We have to have the right spirit too. The people in Malachi's time didn't have the right spirit. And that's what the proverb writer is talking about here. And that is someone who is wicked. Someone who uh, uh, is, I mean, they're offering sacrifice to God, but their life is entirely different. And of course, we call that hypocrisy, don't we? Yeah. Uh, but that's exactly what Malachi is indicting these people of, of half-hearted service to him. And that's as bad as the wicked, you know, someone who is a hypocrite. If your heart's not in it, if you're not worshiping in spirit and serving God with your heart, what good is your service? Yikes. We'll stop there, verse 10, next week. Good evening. For the past like two years, I've been working in a, the news broadcast, studio broadcast, making news. And the thing, the ethic is always, if you're doing live anchoring or even helping someone like setting up tech for someone who's anchoring, you always find a spot. Wear something where you can hide the microphone. Find a way to hide the microphone, hide the wire. I was like thinking, how am I going to hide the wire? Because the goal is always either where, if you're going to hide the wire, Wear more clothes or wear darker clothes. And I'm up here and like I've got a white shirt. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I was trying to find a place. All right, how can I hide the wire on the mic? Then I like, looked around and I was like, and I was like they don't care. And, um, <laughs> but um, 
one of the other, my main job is in film restoration, and I, I know that's the most fun topic that gets brought up here, is my life in film restoration. In film restoration, in motion picture film specifically, there's a phenomenon known as vinegar syndrome. And what it is, is in the lifespan of a motion picture film, like an actual piece of film, there's the life when it's healthy and then it starts to go bad. And at a certain point on a color negative or color positive, specifically color, piece of film, there will be a point where it fades and you'll see like slides. You'll hold them up like even if you have slides yourself, they'll be pink or red. They'll fade to have no color. And on a reel of motion picture film, specifically, they'll get sticky. They won't be able to tear itself from one piece of film on the roll to the next. And the thing that where it gets its name is it will literally smell like vinegar. And that's how you can tell if you get a can of film that has this, you can just smell it and it will smell like vinegar. And at that point, that is basically when you know that that film is basically worthless, that it, you may as well junk it. It is beyond use. The only use that it has is if by chance it happens to be a lost film and that's the only record that's there of that movie. At that point, when it has vinegar syndrome, you may as well junk it. You may as well throw it away. It has no value. It's beyond repair. It's beyond the point of where you can restore it. You can't do anything with it. And the reason I bring this up is when it talks about, because the way I'm relating this is, we like to think of people, like people's souls, and even not even in a religious context, just morally in general, even the, the outside world has the view that in the morality, there are people who, can, who are good, and there are people who are bad but can be saved, but there are some people who are so bad that they can't be saved. They're beyond repair, and this is universal that people have this idea. And we obviously, as Christians, the whole idea of Christianity and becoming a Christian is having your life be in a situation where it can be repaired. So we obviously know that that's not true. We obviously know that there's not a soul that can't be saved by God's grace. Now, that doesn't mean that you are going to save every soul. Because people like to have the idea that what that means is that every soul can be saved, that there's no soul beyond saving, they think that they can go out and convert any soul. That's just not realistic. Because there are some people that you, not that they're beyond saving, but that you cannot save because they need to discover that for themselves or for any other reason that they just won't, you're not going to help them. It's just an unfortunate reality, but that does not mean, that's not to be confused with people who are beyond repair, who just don't have a life that is worth living or can be saved. So anyone, we know this, anyone can be saved. Anyone can have their life restored. So that's what this whole lesson is about, is about how unlike vinegar syndrome, that point is you can't save that. Where it's beyond use, you may as well throw it away. There's no more life that you can squeeze out of this. There's no... There's nothing that it has value for. We know that as human beings, we don't have that. We don't have the vinegar syndrome. We're not beyond repair. We can be saved. We can be restored, and we have the opportunity to be restored. And that's why people become Christian, because that's what they want. They want to be saved. They want to be restored. And you can do that. You can be restored. You can be saved. And that's what this invitation is all about, is giving you the invitation to be saved and to be changed and to be converted and to be restored and to not be, and to take advantage of the fact that you can be repaired. And that's just not just if you're not a Christian at all, that's if you are a Christian and you have fallen away and you want to be saved even beyond that because you've fallen away and you've gone back to a state of disrepair and you need to be repaired again. Whichever one it is, whether you have not been baptized, whether you haven't been saved in the first place, or you have been and you've fallen away, you can be saved and restored by coming forward as we stand and sing this song.
Thank you for those thoughts, Evan. Appreciate that very much. I'd like to welcome each of us back again next uh, Sunday morning, 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for worship, and again at 5 p.m. for Sunday night service. Um, good to see Gig with us. I know he had eye surgery. Went well. Thumbs up. The next one, I think he said, is in August. Give the one a little chance to heal. So, Anything further before we're dismissed in prayer? Ryan? Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, King of Kings, we humble ourselves before you. Father, we praise you for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, for all the ways that you have richly blessed us as your children in this life. Um, we thank you, Father, for the wisdom in your word. We thank you for the wisdom in the Proverbs and the comparisons and the contrasts that you have shown us so clearly. Pray that we would take these things into our minds and into our hearts that we may better serve you. Father, we thank you for this congregation and the ways that you have richly blessed us within it. We thank you for each member. We thank you for the strength that you've given us as a group. And we thank you for, we especially thank you for the teachers in this congregation and all that that means to us and all that that means to you as your children, as your servants. Father, I pray that as we leave this place tonight and we go back out into the world that we would always focus on you and we would be lights in this world and do our very best every day to serve you and to lead others to you. I pray that we would never forsake the great blessings that you have given us through your son and his life that perfect sacrifice that he made on our behalf. We know that without this, that our life is worthless, and I pray that we would always keep that at the forefront of our minds, that we would do our very best to be soldiers for you in this world of darkness. Father, we thank you again for all that you do for us. We praise you, and I pray that if we do fall short of your glory, that we would repent of those things we will turn away from those things and always seek to better serve you tomorrow than we did today in jesus name i pray amen, amen.